Okay, so this is uh, our first using query call of the new year. Um, I've just dropped another link to the agenda that I hacked together a few minutes ago. Um, I'm going to let Brendan lead, but I think there's a couple things that are worth sort of talking about as a group. One is uh, a preview of 040, which uh, will be released uh, whenever we start talking about that. Um, and uh, we wrote some blog posts to um, kind of demonstrate what's capable on query today, and we can happy to go through those if there's some time. But we also want to focus on uh, some of the use cases uh, that we've designed in the real world. So Chris and I met with Richard a couple months ago and uh, had a great conversation with him that led us to say that query really should be working for users like Richard. So I'm, I'm hoping to make sure that he connects with the rest of the query team um, to kind of talk about the ways uh, he manages public data and shares the, the work he's done so that others can build upon it. Uh, with that B5, can I give it to you? Are you ready for a little 040 preview? Um, we also typically begin with uh, intros. Um, and I know Richard knows Chris and me, but does the rest of the query team want to um, do a quick intro of who we are? Yeah, yeah sure. sure. Hi, uh, I'm Dustin. I'm an engineer at Query uh, in the New York office. And yeah, uh, excited to be here. I can go next. Uh, I'm Brendan. I, I work at Query uh, as uh, the caretaker. Casey or Chris? I guess yeah, I could nominate. Yeah. Casey, go ahead. Uh, Casey's looking for headphones currently, and Chris is uh, finding a spot to, uh, to meet from. Hey, can I? Uh, I'm Chris Wong. Um, outreach engineer, so uh, presently working on a lot of sort of use case development, um, a lot of like basically hacking on the app myself, or hacking on the, the software in general, uh, and just putting data into it and seeing what, uh, what it can be used for in the real world. Uh, so yeah, lots of that. Casey? Do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure, sorry. I literally, this is the first time I'm hearing anything that's happening. So, uh, yes, in intros is happening? <laughs> yes, please. I'm um, not sure what anyone else has said, but hi, I'm Casey. I work at Query. Um, and yes, I'm a dev here and uh, excited to see new names on this list here. Cool. Rob, do you want to give a quick, quick intro? Hey, I'm Rob. Um, I otherwise have nothing to do with Query, uh, other than I think it's a really awesome project, and I float around and make a real nuisance of myself, which I'm trying to do less of, um, being interested in whatever's going on. Cool, thanks. Uh, Richard, do you want to go next? Yep, and I was actually going to turn my video on for the intro, but uh, this is the first time I've used Zoom on this pretty new computer, and it won't let me unless I restart Zoom, which would kill me from this call. So um, you can just imagine what I meant it looked like. Um, yeah, so Catalina. With Robin, uh, wear a number of hats. Uh, I guess for this call, uh, it's as a member of uh, the Upper West Side Community Board Number Seven. Uh, and have done a lot of data analysis um, using publicly accessible uh, police crash data just to figure out um, what's happening with the uh, huge number of uh, crashes and injuries and fortunately a relatively small number of fatalities, but um, greater than zero, which is unacceptable. So trying to use data to figure out uh, what we as a community board as well as city agencies, the yeah, Department of Transportation and the Police Department might do to try to reduce the number of crashes. And uh, I'm a hack. I'm not good with using data. And I've been like kind of plugging along, trying to figure out the best way of doing it, but it's really cumbersome and difficult. So if there's a tool out there that would work, uh, not just for me, but for people like me who are trying to use uh, 
large data sets to um, to make sense of them. That would be awesome. That's, That's so exciting. Uh, cool. And then the last one is a six four six number I don't recognize. Otherwise, I'd love to introduce you. But do you want to say hello? Oh. Sorry, this is Lamine. I wasn't sure if we were supposed to participate today from the Nazis. Uh, I mean, we have a regular call at seven thirty, but you're more than welcome to stay uh, and listen in for this call. And uh, we're happy to just show you guys what's going on. Yeah, sure. Can I do that? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, we'd be pumped to have you. This is great. Um, cool. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and thank you for stumbling through our shows. We're coming back into the new year, and we're kind of still finding our groove again in terms of going around the room. Normally, we like pick on the next person. There's a whole thing, or uh, but yeah, it's uh, yeah. So as as Rico sort of mentioned, we're we're gonna go through some stuff, but I mainly just want two big things we want to do uh, with 040, just preview some of the stuff we're working on, but also really get some time to get some input on a lot of this. So I think it'll be a pretty quick little demonstration of, of um, a set of wireframes and mockups that we have in Sketch, and then we'll just get a chance to talk through. Uh, Rob, just, just before a conversation, posted some great stuff about bugs in 0 0.3.3 um, that we released like this morning, uh, <laughs> which is awesome. And so yeah, just uh, this, this call is intended to be on structured time um, as much as possible, but we try to give a structured piece to start with uh, just so that there's some point of conversation. Uh, but before I do that, as, as Rico mentioned, we have actually started putting up um, some new blog posts that are, I think are like actually exciting because they're informative of how we're actually using query from here forward. So we're going to start calling those out um, in just in the meeting, in the notes for these calls. Um, and so there's, uh, Rico's added links to the, to those themselves and we will, and Rico, if you could, I wouldn't mind just like linking each in chat um, so that anybody who doesn't have the notes can just see them quickly in chat. You got it. Uh, um, thank you so much, sir. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to share my screen and I'll just quickly go through uh, some of what we're planning for uh, the sort of like next milestone release of desktop. And uh, ideally, we'll sort of just talk through some of this. But uh, when I switch into this share screen mode, I can never see anybody's face. So if you want to interrupt me, just like like unmute yourself and yell. Uh, and we and please do interrupt me as we talk through a lot of this. Um, so yeah, I just want to quickly, we'll start uh, quickly with, uh, so this is, you're looking at the way that we actually plan things now. We've been trying to inject more planning of our uh, work as we go, but uh, Casey, what, um, the, the 033 uh, mockups, where are those? Uh, are they just all over the place? No, we don't, do I not have the latest, I just want to make sure I have the latest file. Uh, that's okay if we don't have it. All right, whatever. Um, so I guess the biggest thing is that we should just, we'll just skip that. Um, starting with, oh, here it is, yes. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna try and ship um, into Query Desktop uh, coming, moving sort of forward the next little bit, hopefully everyone can see this, is uh, a browse experience. Um, and so this is bringing, we've been working a bunch on sort of a, a number of different things. And one of the biggest things we're trying to do is sort of like uh, focused in a bunch of our work so that it's a little easier for us to maintain fewer code bases that, that are of a higher quality. Uh, and we've had a number of things that we've wanted to sort of ship around the capacity to sort of meet this high level goal of, it should be really simple for someone to create a data set with query, hit publish, and inside of the same app, see that sort of like public network of data sets. Um, and for folks who are coming to this new, we've, we're, uh, we've talked to a number of folks who are uh, sort of like getting used to what we make and really just want that sort of like initial example data set uh, something that sort of walks them through, hey, what, do, what does it mean to use query? What does a query data set look like? What does the versioning look like? Um, and so for that reason, we've elected to actually, uh, literally all of our front end code bases, including our docs website, are now all written in React. Um, and so we're able to pull a whole bunch of code from Query Cloud and move it into this desktop side of things, which is ideally should speed things up and should also make for like a higher quality experience because our desktop experience is the best tested. Um, yeah. And so uh, what, we're, what you're looking at is sort of this newest tab in the earliest state that it's going to sort of land before we start. Um, and the, a couple of things to note here, we have a compare view mocked out here, which is not going to ship for a long time. But this will be sort of a, a live differ that we'll talk about in another call. But today, the big, the big tab I want to focus on is this. It's current, currently, if you open Query Desktop 033, uh, it just has these two tabs, the uh, collection view and a data set workbench view. Uh, and so today we're going to, uh, in the coming couple weeks, we're going to add this network view, which will let you sort of see the same stuff that effectively you see right now if you go to query.cloud. 
um, which is our sort of like registry that we published to. But we're gonna add a couple of things on top of that. And the first thing that we're gonna add, um, I just wanna start from the left of the screen, uh, is a toggle switch that will allow us to turn on and off the peer-to-peer -peer networking components of um, query, a query's backend system. And so for those of you who don't know, query actually has a couple of methods for moving data around. One is using traditional sort of centralized services that we call cloud. And then the other is using a peer-to-peer -peer system that allows you to push data directly to and from each other. But uh, actually, Lamine, who's on this call today, uh, has been having, we have had a number of folks um, come up, come to us and say that the actual performance requirements of running a peer-to-peer -peer network um, on their machine just like isn't, uh, isn't really acceptable for their day-to-day -day work. And so what we want to ship is this switch so that we, when you click that, it'll turn it off and it'll make sure that query's resource requirements are much lower than they would be otherwise. You can still publish to the centralized systems, but um, we'll, you'll be able to sort of like flip that on and off much more dynamically than you can right now. Um, just quickly turning around to the, some of the top level here. Oh, Rob, do you have a question you want to stop on that first? I don't want to get yeah, too much noise on this, but yeah, I do want to chat about this. Yeah, um, I, hopefully this is not getting too deep in the weeds, and if it is, defer it till after. Um, but just curious on that, are you are you switching like peer-to-peer -peer everything on and off, or is there also like a difference between, um, I mean, in IPFS terms, uh, like being a uh, um, participant versus client? Uh, um, yeah. It'd be nice to be able to like reduce the P2P requirements, but not move all the way away if possible. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah, so I, I do want to get into the weeds with it, but I want to do that later. <laughs> and, but the short answer is this completely turns off all peer-to-peer -peer networking. Um, and in the future, we gotcha. will ship refinements on that. So first thing we're going to ship is on and off. And then later on, we'll ship a throttle that'll say uh, a number of ways to sort of constrain the resources that peer-to-peer -peer systems use. Um, that's planned. Cool. Um, but for now, we just want, hey, turn this off, I need this to be functional. Um, and so this is just based on some feedback that we've been getting. Um, so this should make query to consume far less, far fewer resources, particularly from open file descriptors. But anyways, skipping that. Moving on to the stuff that we're actually here to talk about. Uh, so the biggest thing we'll notice is we're now shipping sort of a classic browser and search, search and browse features across the entire app. And so anywhere within the app, we've, we've had this question come up a bunch, just like, I wanna just be able to search for a data set, get to a data set really quickly, and then hit clone really quick. Um, so basically search for something and get it. And so across the entire app, I can even show you like sort of how the tradition, how the current um, like uh, structure editor looks, even this like, even when we're in the workbench, which we, we're renaming this to the workbench, you'll have this sort of breadcrumb trail and a search bar and a back and forward button as you would in any sort of classic sort of browsing system. Um, so that's what we've been calling this our browse experience. Um, but the, the point here is like, we want to make it so that from any point, if, if someone told you about a data set on query, you could search for it very quickly and get to that thing without any context. Um, and so that, so we just have a mock-up generally of how search will look. Um, generally what that'll look like is you'll be able to say, hey, I'll, I'll come in here and I'll click on, say, for example, I'm working on a data set and someone says, hey, I want to show you this bank data set. I'd be able to search for this. We'll get a modal that will now show you the search results. Um, and then obviously this would not, this would give you results that are accurate. You know, searching for banks wouldn't give you earthquake oriented results. Um, we'll give you a nice toggle here eventually that lets you say, hey, just show me stuff in my own local data set uh, collection. Uh, and then once you click that, you'll be taken to um, a, because that's a data set that you probably, if it's a data set that you don't have, we'll be taking you to um, a view of that data set, which is kind of an evolution. This is basically the next screen, just a data set preview. Um, and this will be an evolution of what we currently see on query.cloud. And so you'll be able to actually very quickly from within the app, see a data set and then have this button really that easily we're, we're working on what they actually call this but this will just put that data set in your local collection of data sets it'll be very fast very straightforward um this mock-ups this is how it's going to look in the near future uh a couple of releases down the line we're actually going to start showing the version history uh right right in the actual data set itself and showing you which version that you're currently looking at um, and so this ideally will start to help people orient themselves where they are in a given spot um, what version they're looking at, when did they last see it, and be able to quick click through very quickly and to see how something has evolved over time. Um, so yeah, I think I actually just want to stop there really quick um, and just sort of uh, gauge the room on some of our browse experience. That's the big stuff we're sort of looking to ship in the next little while is just having this nice uh, sort of like, hey, I can, I'm at home, you'll see the speed of data sets that are interesting. You can very quickly click one of these. It'll take you to a screen that looks a lot like this. 
when you're here, you'll have this button that is not on this mockup. Sorry, I should have gone to this other mockup. Apologies. Um, I'll be able to click add to my collection. That will move us in really quickly. Um, that will just give you that data. And now you'll have that data set. And you from there, you can export the data set to a common system. So do that in Excel workbench or workbook. Uh, or move that into just a CSV file. Um, that should be really straightforward. Um, and if you want to fork it and edit it yourself, that should also be sort of a one-click process. So I'll stop there. Um, just like have some time for questions. That's a lot, I think. But um, anything jump out at anyone? I, I think it looks like a really great set of improvements. Um, I think one of the things I have been thinking about lately while looking at it, and this the addition of the, the network panel drives some a little bit more for me, is um, the distinction in query between sort of global application collection level information and like a working data set or an active data set. Um, and for me, like, and this also drives back to obviously a theme for me has continually been like a data set is a table. How do I connect, et cetera? Uh, like, insofar as, as data sets don't connect meaningfully beyond that right now, um, like, it would be really nice to be able to see more than one at a time and trying to think through the implications of like, is there a better way to break up? windows by like active data sets or like where does global stuff belong? Like should network really be another side panel versus like a, a setting screen? Um, but like just having it there is super awesome. Um, and like the stuff that you're adding is great. Yeah, lovely. I'm, it's glad, I'm glad to hear a look um, and totally hear you played with some mockups around tab browsing so the idea of being able to have multiple tabs um, and I voted against it for now on the purpose that I wanted to make sure that the performance was good enough that we ship something that was clean and easy with one tab <laughs> and then and then we can sort of move to another tab uh, I think the short-term trick that we will end up being able to ship that should make being able to compare two data sets a little easier is uh, is ideally we'll have, uh, you'll be able to either, for now, in the next couple of releases, you'll be able to just create two query windows. Um, so you can literally just like browse to two different things. Uh, the next, so I mean, there, there are two. If I can, I, I, may, I may be a dying breed, but honestly, having a, a, an, an active data set be a window, like would be, I would very much appreciate that. And I think that would actually be better than tabs for me. Then, then, so. you, then we can ship with you what you want even sooner, which is great. <laughs> and I think a tab view is sort of like, that's definitely in the distance fu distant future for us. Um, but so good to hear that you're okay with that. Um, but just to sort of round out that answer, um, so we've there are two th two other major things on, on our road on our roadmap. We want to be able to sort of browse really quickly because we think it's really important to see this active network of data sets that you can sort of pull from and derive from. And uh, we intend for that to really be like uh, Chris and Rico are putting a bunch of time into creating new data sets and posting them, specifically because we want to start sort of like engaging sort of with the actual like engaging what it means to be a community of practice around creating and curating version data. Um, and uh, Richard, hearing your briefing, it's be really, I'd really love to take some time to dig in on what it would mean to sort of like understand the kind of data sets that would be helpful for you to see, uh, because we are actively sort of building some of these. Um, and it would, we, so the first thing we want you to be able to do is just turn on the app and see the data that we're talking about and not leave. This browse experience is number one. The second thing we really want to ship is uh, basic CSV editing tools. Uh, we, we think there's a major hole for like, just being able to edit structured data the same way that you work in Excel. A number of us have like Excel or Apple numbers or some sort of like simple uh, like table editing tool. And we're often finding that it's doing weird stuff to our data and it's making it hard to sort of like communicate clean, clearly and easily. And so we're going to ship some really basic editing into uh, the workbench so that you can actually edit data without checking any data, anything out, without any, doing anything weird. Like just ideally, it'll just be a really simple, hey, I want to create a new data set. I want to edit these things. I want to publish that. And then the last thing we want yeah, to I mean share. The, um, go ahead, Richard. Oh, go, ahead. Yeah. go ahead. No, that's great. I'd love you to interrupt me. <laughs> so um, when I met with Chris and Rico, I think you know, one of the main things I was showing was just this data set I've created of crash data uh, that I put a lot of effort into cleaning up. And so, and I'm far from being a sophisticated uh, web user of, um, 
of data tools. So when I see a browser like what I saw, it feels inflexible because um, I don't know how to jump in and like um, just cut and paste data, flip it back and forth between Excel and Word if I need to, just to be able to clean it up. And hearing about tools that can help me clean it up, and ideally that would automatically clean it up, would be great as long as I can figure out what they are. And as I said when I met with them, I don't know to what extent I'm a typical user. And you know, it could be that I'm a great case because I'm you know, not that sophisticated, but I'm trying to dig in and really make use of the data. Or I could be an anomaly who uh, is just off of my own. Uh, but you know, if there's no ability to make changes, uh, then I feel like I'm in a, um, like an entrapped environment where I just don't have flexibility that I need. Uh, but the, the challenge I've had with dealing with what I've been doing, of, you know, either Excel or Google Sheets and Word, is that it's just a pain in the ass. And I'm going through and like writing up a search and replace and trying to figure out, and like a great example of what I showed them was the data that I'm getting from the PD crash reports has um, in some cases the crash happening on a street and the cross street being the avenue. And in other cases, it's the opposite. And so if I want to look at all the crashes happening on Broadway, if I'm searching by street, I might get half of them, but the other half are the avenue of you know, 61st Street or 79th Street or 96th Street. And so that's like one thing I'm cleaning up, like putting all the data into um, new columns that I've created, one for street, which is, you know, 59, 60 up to 110, which is our district, and the other avenues of Central Park West, Columbus, Amsterdam. Um, so to the extent the tool ideally would do that automatically, if not that, uh, would at least allow me to make, uh, to have flexible changes that are easy to make, then it's valuable. Um, if, it's, if it's restrictive in doing that, then it's just easier to use uh, a Google Sheets or an Excel that lets me uh, make those changes. And that's where uh, the getting capabilities could be real interesting. Absolutely. Um, Chris, do you want to follow up with that? Because I know that this is really your big Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm more familiar with, uh, with Richard's use case, but yeah, I think um, to, to give you some confidence, um, we're, we're going for exactly that. We want to be able to have you um, inside of Query Desktop, be able to do the kinds of quick edits, either by manually overwriting things or by doing like simple field calculations, um, in order to make sure that you know, basically so that you don't have to leave Query Desktop to to make a bunch of changes and uh, you know as you would in a normal table view uh, inside of like Sheets or or uh, Excel. So I think that's exactly what we're going for. Um, and then you don't have to be switching back and forth. I mean, I think there's a you know, there's a world where you can, a world before, I guess, where you could have imagined query as you know, the, the archival step uh, and you do your work elsewhere. Um, but I think by and large, we're trying to make the, the, seam, the, the experience a little more seamless because these other editors, you know, will start adjusting fonts and doing colors and things like that, which don't really belong in the data set. Um, so I think that's what we're trying to do is make sure that there's a way to, to edit like you're in a spreadsheet, but, but get rid of all the spreadsheet stuff that you really don't need in the data set or shouldn't be in the data set. Does that make sense? The other thing is uh, another interesting use case I have, which I succeeded at for a while and then tried to replicate and failed, was as I'm looking at every crash, I'd love to know, map it to the weather. So. If a crash happened on March 10th, uh, 2017 at 4 o'clock p.m., what was the weather at that time? And at some point, I found another data set that had hourly weather and did, figured out a way to do a lookup and um, figure out for each crash what the weather was at that time. Um, and I haven't since been able to find that, uh, that data set and also the, the effort involved in uh, doing that v lookup was pretty significant so having tools like that and being able to have a data set and do some cross query uh could be really helpful
Richard, Richard that's super helpful. Yeah, and I, I want to just really quickly share my screen to talk through uh, some of the specific editing stuff. Um, but before we do that, uh, yeah, um, to connect some train cars, uh, you share Rob's desire to be able to sort of like take two data sets, smash them together really straightforward um, in a way that is like allows you to get this aggregate together. Uh, we're, we have, there are ways to do that inside of query today. They are a little bit obtuse and they're not very well exposed in desktop. Um, but that's, that's very much something we're sort of wanting to work. We're working toward this side. Cause to me, the idea of like you being able to very, if, if we live, if we make a thing where you can very quickly take the data you're working on and add a weather column, um, I think we're, uh, I think we're headed in the right direction. Um, but setting that aside for a second, because I don't have mockups to sort of show how some of that might work, mainly because we're not, it's not like an immediate thing for us. I do want to show some of the editing stuff and just get your feedback on what you think of uh, some of this. Um, so uh, to that end, uh, so we've been talking much about the network tab today, but a lot of your questions sort of really surround this workbench tab. Uh, this idea of um, hopefully this yeah sticks okay go away yeah. Uh, so for us, we call the workbench this um, this single data set icon. Um, so I, normally this would to actually mock this up properly. This would be selected like this. Cool. Um, so when we're in the workbench, this is like your editing area and where you're able to act, actually able to sort of manipulate stuff. Um, and so the thing that we're going to ship in the very near future is like being able to just click cells and, and have an editor appear over that cell, which sounds like not that big a deal, but for us is quite a big challenge. But this, uh, not quite a big challenge, it's just doing it right and doing it well is, is, another, uh, is another thing. Um, but then I want to call your attention to two things that I think hopefully speak to uh, some of what you're talking about and specifically in terms of cleaning up data over time. Uh, so every, as we've mentioned, everything in query is version. So ideally what's happening here is you're bringing in data that is gross and messy. Uh, that's a version. And then as you make changes, you version the improvements over time and other folks can sort of watch the work that you're doing. Now, if, if this were software, the way that we would actually look at the changes that you've been making is using something called a diff. Uh, and what we've been working on for a long time is how do we do actually visually represent a diff. A diff is just a way of understanding what has changed between one version of a data set and another. Um, and the other side of what we really want to know is um, if you were to be able to, uh, in your example, you're defining cross streets um, that uh, there were cross streets that were invalid or sort of types of uh, inputs that were sort of inconsistent and yielded um, poor returns. And so uh, the, the one that you define is actually one of the toughest ones to get around because it's sort of like really manual cleaning. Like you really need to understand the data intimately that you're talking about. But for many other things, like we have these common sort of validation problems of like um, needing to know like a certain value should say inside of a, uh, like this number should always be less than five type thing. And for that, we want to be able to define these things called validation rules, which are very quick and easy ways of making sure that data stays the way that you expect it. Um, and so what I'm showing you right now is a mock-up that inc includes all three of those things at the same time. So we have an example of editing a cell here really quickly and easily, which is quite blase, just the fact that uh, all it points to is in this side of this workbench, you can actually edit all of the data live. As you said, that's just kind of a hard necessity. Um, and as Chris has been saying, this is our effort to sort of bring that whole experience inside of desktop. The next thing you're seeing is, are these sort of orange um, highlights? These for us represent what it would look like to have a validation error on a data set or on a column. And so if you clicked on this um, thing, we would have, we have these sort of like inspector panels. This, this one shows uh, column stats. This is a live inquiry today. You can click any one of these columns and you will see um, a chart uh, representing statistics around that column, which is great and fine and wonderful. But in this case, uh, this is showing an example of if a validation rule were defined that said, hey, um, this, this grantor name column should always have, uh, should not start with the word the, um, this, uh, it would, clicking any of these cells would bring open this inspector on the side and show the validation rule that's been broken. You could then click that and edit it and make it not be yellow. And so you, by, um, uh, you basically bring it into validation, um, which should ideally help with the cleaning process. If you can define rules for yourself in advance that say, Hey, this is how this sort of should look, um, then you ideally sort of query can just highlight for you all of the problem cells um, as based, based on rules that you've defined. Um, under, we're using a whole bunch of technologies that are sort of like complementary of this under the hood, um, but the actual process of defining those validation rules would be uh, graphical and click and like basically point and click click. Cool, I'm gonna set that up. And once you set them once for your data set, they sort of live with every version of your data set then on, or on forward. So ideally you define your validation one time and those validation rules become a kind of value that accumulates with the data set you're working on. 
And then just to close this out, um, if you were to set a, if, if an example, we sort of click this uh, and updated this cell to make it valid, that's now a change. And we wanna be able to sort of see how that change happened between two data sets. And that's what these sort of green and red are actually showing is this is an example of a diff between two versions. Uh, in this mockup, what you're seeing is the diff between uh, your working data set, so a data set that you're presently editing, and the latest save, or we call them commits, uh, of a data set. And so in this case, uh, this, red, this red bar, if you were to click this, it will show you what this value used to be in the old version, and the green shows it what it currently is. Uh, and so anything that has changed between now and the last time that you edited, any edits to this data set that are live would be highlighted in green. Um, and that would sort of like make it a little easier ideally to see what's changed between any two data sets. Uh, being able to calculate a diff is uh, also the subject of this sort of compare view that we have here. Uh, I think we actually have some basic mockups of what compare will look like. They're pretty rough right now, but the point being of the point of compare and the most important thing we want to sort of draw to is you can just compare any two things. So uh, if you had an old CSV file um, showing data or you got a new uh, dump of accident data, uh, you would be able to very quickly compare the new version with the old version um, just by dragging those two files over um, a desktop. This is obviously pretty wireframing, but basically you could just say CSV file A over this left side, CSV file B over this right side, and then you would quickly get that highlighted diff of what's different between different between the two. Does any of that seem like it's getting close to this sort of like edit conversation? I know this isn't exactly your use case, but I thought I'd just sort of like bring this up as a as a starting point. Um, I mean, it looks like they're interesting tools. It doesn't look like uh, exactly the use case I'm mentioning. Totally. And if anything, even the um, like getting rid of the the, uh, <laughs> can that be done by batch or does it have to be done individually? Um, it. I guess right now, yeah, individually. Well, we can script things. Um, we can use transform scripts that are sort of here, which is just writing Python code, but it is running code. Um, so like we're currently, we don't have plans for like a visual sort of like batch edit system, um, which uh, clearly sounds like it's part of your use case and, um, and your needs. Yeah, I would think uh, anyone who's, uh, you know, using the example on the screen, if you're trying to get rid of the uh, to start, uh, and you've got multiple examples, you're not gonna to wanna to have to go through and edit each Every one individually. One. Totally, totally. Um, to get a feel for the kind of data you work with, how many, like typically how many accidents are you sort of working with per, like, uh, I don't know, per unit of when you get new data? Uh, so I download um, whenever I have time or whenever I have a report I need to do. Uh, on average, like, go to the file. I think I gave you guys access to the file, mm. but I, I, I'm guessing, I think there have been around 30,000 crashes uh, in the district. Uh, open up the file, but um, I think it's about 30,000 uh, in eight years. So doing the math, that's uh, 3,000 a year roughly. Right out there. Right. So that's a lot of, yeah. And, and so have you, do you feel like you've hand looked at every cell? No, no, okay. no, no way. Um, nor do I care to, I mean, if, <laughs> yeah. if, if I were, it would be a totally changed uh, uh, initiative. But actually I'm a little off it. So from uh, the data I have in my spreadsheet is from July of 2012 through November of 2019, which is the last time I updated it. And there are 23,000 and some odd crashes. So it's you know, roughly you know, 3,000 a year. Dang, that's a good, that's a good chunk of data. <laughs> yeah. And, and and so you're currently editing that mainly with Excel, or what's your main tool for sort of? I doing switched it? to Google Sheets because it was um, it was uh, better to to deal with manipulating. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and then I'll copy parts back and forth into Word if I want to do a big search and replace. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's super smart. Um, yeah. That's something. Yeah, I, I it could be an anomaly there, but I do that a lot when I'm trying to clean up data. Just to, just uh, just to be able to get yeah. plain text and then edit the plain text and do that. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Um, yeah, for that reason, I mean, 
and I think what, what I think is interesting about that during this conversation, like if you have a workflow that's working well with Google Sheets, like there's no reason that you should sort of need, feel like you need to use the tools that we just showed you. Um, because as, as you mentioned, like this isn't, uh, the sort of a validation logic that we're showing is very sort of hand edity if, you, if you're doing like a manual cleanup and sort of intended not, it's not really intended for 26,000 rows. The validation side very much um, sort of like a, the prefix doesn't sound too super useful, but when you start dealing mainly with numbers, um, there are sort of like sanity checks that you can do in terms of validation. Like, you know, the idea that this, um, this figure, if like as examples, like temperature um, gauges should never yield higher than like 120 degrees Fahrenheit if they're outside. If they do, then like there's something wrong with the gauge and it's probably an invalid number. Um, and so like that kind of stuff, being able to do 25,000 rows and very quickly show, say, just show me only the invalid um, rows is like a generally sort of useful for the viewing side of things. But in your, in your example, you, it sounds like you've developed a super robust way of sort of uh, prepping up this data and cleaning it up yourself. And so for that, I think we would Yeah, say, but it's real, yeah, I mean, it's real cobbled together. Totally. And, uh, and, and again, I, I keep saying, I don't know if I'm a good use case for you guys. If I'm a, a mix of someone who's a, a power user, but also a hack. And uh, <laughs> I'm trying to, um, you know, really pushing my abilities and probably going far beyond what most people might do. Um, but not being a trained data analyst who knows how to use more sophisticated tools. And so to the extent that this is an example of how uh, an automated tool could help bring more sophisticated data analysis, data cleanup and analysis to the masses, uh, it could be a good example. But I'm not sure how representative no, I am. Totally, I, I'm definitely sure that you're representative. <laughs> I think that uh, the idea, like uh, we, I've never met anybody in the world of data science who hasn't added the phrase like, you know, I, I don't. I don't think that you're a hack, even though even though I've not seen your work. I can tell that you're not. Um, I think we all have this sort of like, no, but we don't do it the official way. And part of the reason that we we started working on query is there isn't really um, a great place to discuss what it means to be official. Um, we don't want to be the official way, but we, there isn't really a hey, this is how I do it. This is how I do it. Let's compare those in a meaningful way. Uh, we don't have a lot of that in the world of data, um, and so I think that I don't think there's anything wrong with the way that you work, and I don't think that just because you aren't writing hardcore um, code or doing some in ingest pipeline, um, doesn't mean that there's anything less valid about the work that you're doing. Um, you know, what I'm, what I'm here to try to convince you to do is hit export on that Google sheet to a CSV file once every, every now and then, and then publish that to query so that we can see some of the stuff that you're doing. And then ideally we can come around and publish some weather data back and make for an easy fee lookup. Um, I don't think that what we, the idea that we're gonna build a system for you that is better than what you currently have, um, with five people in a room uh, in Brooklyn is definitely not the case, but can we complement what you do? Hopefully, right? And that's, I think that's the sort of goal here is make sure that we can make something that makes your life a little easier from the perspective of being able to sort of like uh, get in, get out, see data that is useful. And there are, now that there are folks on the other end of a wire uh, hearing the kind of work that you're doing, and I, I'm personally really interested in seeing some of this, uh, the use case that you're explaining is exactly why we got into this in the first place. Um, we really want to, uh, make your life easier. Um, that's that's pretty close to the sort of like reason for doing this project. Um, so hopefully that, yeah, but I think there's, uh, but I, at the same time, I don't want to replace your tools. I don't think that um, like you, you clearly have enough time constraints in your life, you're doing other things. Um, what we want to do instead is integrate with the tools you already have. Um, and so does that, if we put it, if we frame it that way, does this start to make a little more sense or do you feel like- Yeah, uh, it does. It, it, it makes I think an example of that is uh, I mentioned to Chris and Rico when we met, uh, I've been throwing data into, or I had tried throwing data into Tableau and got some visualizations out of Tableau, which were helpful, but it also like was another tool and just another effort to learn how to use Tableau and figure out uh, the right way of doing everything. Started having challenges where things weren't working and then just didn't feel like putting more effort into it. And I'm sure I could, I could reach out to Tableau. Uh, I have people I know who know it really well, but it's just a matter of how much effort I can put in, which is limited. And, and I think it's the same with any tool. If there's a tool that I can jump into that's easy to use and that provides real benefit, 
thrilled to do it if it's something that um, makes my life harder and confused and like I would need a, a major effort to learn this tool and troubleshoot then it's just not worth it. I think you hit the nail on the head because that, that's basically our mission, right? Is, is, is shift something that gets you some value in as few clicks as possible. Um, and ideally with as few phone calls to, uh, to tech support as possible. Um, yeah. Um, so it, with that in mind, I'd love to, I'd love to see if we can't run an experiment, um, Richard, if you're, if you're at all interested. Um, and basically it sounds like you want to complement the data that you're already gathering with additional information that would help contextualize some of that information. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's a mix of, I think my, my challenges are number one, cleaning the data, number two, analyzing it, number three, adding to it. Totally. And so number one, you're constant and you're, so cleaning is the thing we really need to sort of zero in on as a helpful bit. And you, and ideally you're looking for automation of that cleaning. Yeah, cause it's just a pain in the ass and the more I can. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, and I'm doing all this as a volunteer. So, like, if I want to report, and for example, there's a city council hearing on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And if I could really easily pull data um, and be able to throw it together for the statement that I might be making, um, great. But I'm doing it as a volunteer and I you know, can't afford to spend hours doing it. And the whole process of downloading, cleaning, like looking for errors um, is real time consuming. Totally. And then once I've got it clean, then it's a matter of doing the analysis to figure out, you know, what can I learn from this nice cleaned up data set that I have that's actually useful. Right. Now you've done all the work. The, the, you've done the first 80%. Now you get to do the second 80% of actually like getting some insight out of it. <laughs> Yep, exactly. Totally. All right. And I, I, to that end, I think it'd be really fun to see if we can't help on some of this stuff. I'd, I'd love to actually dig in on what cleaning looks like to you specifically. I, and I, you've given great examples here. Um, but I think if, if you don't mind, I'd love to sort of like continue this conversation outside of the context of this call and see if we can um, have some of the folks that are on the query team look at some of what you're doing. Um, we have people around you who have technical expertise on a lot of this who are uh, who do program around uh, data acquisition and pipelining and cleaning and whatnot. Um, but before we make any promises that we can sort of deliver something, it, it just sounds like I'd love to like get somebody on our team to sort of do a deep dive on, on how we might help with this cleaning part of the process specifically. Um, Cause that, that yeah. bit I think would be really interesting. Um, yeah. And, and it might, and would as, have, a, sorry, go ahead. as a, an ally, I would say, you know, I'd love for you to do some uh, greater market research to, to make sure that you're not devoting huge resources and um, going in a direction just from what I'm doing without knowing that there's a real market need for it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's our job. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thankfully, if, if we get that wrong, that's entirely my fault. And things that are my fault, I can, I can explain and, and, and deal with. Uh, but to me, this is exactly the kind of thing that we want to be working on. Um, if, we can't, if we can't get this right, then we're not doing it right. Um, but yeah. Um, I do, uh, thank you so much, Richard. Hopefully, if you don't mind, we'll reach out by email after this and, and sort of like. Yeah, sure. Do. Awesome. I really appreciate you showing up to today's call. Um, yep. Yeah, to that end, I want to maybe uh, leave some time. Rob, did you have anything that jumped out while we were chatting that sort of like struck you as worth, worth bringing up? I mean, I, all of the things Richard brought up gave me a million thoughts about different things, but they're all, I mean, it's all very brainstormy stuff that I don't know if is super helpful to you or directly actionable. <laughs> but it's That's just, exactly it's what this calls for. Of, yeah. You know. what's, what's the loudest brainstorming bit? Um, I, I mean, I think, so So the first thing I was, I was thinking about was that it feels like the sort of things Richard was talking about are a really great way or place to rethink transforms um, in a better context in the UI, right? If you could instead of seeing a transform as a separate file that runs somewhere, you can just sort of like write a script against a column. Um, and it could be super simple or super complex and then query would just run that. And, and under the hood, that would be something that is a transform or similar to a transform. And you could do a bunch of them before you commit and they just all become transforms that get applied. Um, would be like a 
it seems like the ideal way to sort of treat that in the UI, um, which would be really cool. Uh, but it would require either having some sort of new kinds of, of hooks and transforms or like having a, di a different mechanism so that you can present it more clearly in the UI, right? This is the thing that applies to this column or this series of columns or all columns or whatever. Um, but like, it seems like rethinking transforms along those lines as like a bulk edit to a column or a set of columns would be super cool. And I think it would make transforms make more sense for 90% of people. <laughs> um, so, so that was like the first big thing that came to mind about that. Um, I had a whole bunch of other like, you know, small thoughts, but I guess like the other, other big one was thinking about like the situation Richard's describing, which I think is a relatively common situation that, that you want to hit at with query, which is like, there's some data set somewhere. Um, and really what somebody's doing is like deriving something or cleaning something or curating something from that data set. Um, and I think in a, in a query world, like the ideal, flow there is that if that data set's not already on query you have something that is automatically pulling that data set down from wherever and putting it in query and then you are deriving from that data set to get a new data set um and like what kinds of things could the ui do to like make that a default flow without it seeming like a whole thing that you have to set up right if you're like oh i have this data set that i download from this location um, if you can just say like, I want to like this data that I'm working on is derived from that or based on that or whatever and behind the scenes query goes and makes a data set that is just that downloaded. Um, and, but I mean, you could, you could dive in to see that, but for the most part, that's probably under the hood for you. You just see your data set that's based on that and you make your edits in your data set. Um, so that that way you have that sort of waterfall flow of information and, and it can continue to happen as that external thing gets updated. It would be neat to have that sort of baked into what query desktop does at least. Um, those are the two like big things that came to mind from what Richard was talking about that was like, oh, that would be so nice. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the, I think rethinking transforms and putting a UI on them, um, it's big to me. Chris is really calculate, we've talked, we've talked about them as calculated columns, um, computed columns, right? Being able to just like the classic total cell um, that's, um, a great example of like where a transform would be really helpful. Um, I think, uh, yeah, and the thing, the the connective tissue on that is like we can we need to build some sort of um, selection API into um, trend, into Starlark so that we can say, and then we can just arrange those using a UI as a sort of like I would ideally like it to be non-destructive, um, so that you could sort of say, cool, this is a we could actually sort of like compose things with using a um, visual thing and say, cool, I want to compute this column. As uh, Chris has sort of cited some examples from PostGIS, I believe, um, of like how to do a computer column. Chris, is that right? What was not, the... not PostGIS. Um, uh, ArcMap, ArcMap and QGIS, sorry, ArcMap, which is desktop GIS software, and QGIS has basically uh, the open source world's uh, answer to this same feature. Um, but they're field calculators, they're not really they're not quite the same as a formula you would have in a spreadsheet because a formula in a spreadsheet becomes the content of the cell, sort of, um, or becomes the like formula for the cell. And I think these field calculators are kind of just one-off things. So I think the, the happy medium of there is that you can have them and then remember them, but not have them be like the cell. You know, it's just like a, a thing you can, can come up with to, to programmatically create the contents of a cell remember it somehow in, in a transform hook or some other thing that's not a transform, but is transform like, um, and it's just, you know, one cell. Um, but like, yeah, like a lot of the time if I'm doing that cleaning, I never need it again, but it would be important to know, uh, you know, for anyone looking at the data set, you know, this is how it was actually transformed. Uh, but you don't, you don't need to run it again because you already cleaned the data set. Maybe you do, but like, you know, maybe, maybe not at all. Totally. And like we've been working toward this for some time, a number of changes that we've made in the past that really just to build up to Richard, your use case of like being able to just like click a column or click uh, a column and say, I want to make this set of changes. And then on the left side, you have a palette of with a quick filter of like programmatic adjustments you can make. A long time ago, we had this, we had to figure out the idea of manual transforms versus scripted transforms. This idea of like detangling um, someone just editing a single cell. 
from uh, a, a computer like writing code that, or some sort of code driven change to a cell. So we landed that, what was that, like eight months or a year ago. Um, and the idea of like uh, having uh, transforms only execute once um, was something that we, that was not how query was originally set up. Query was originally sort of more oriented around extract transform load. Uh, and which is like this idea of like this script that runs every time you commit now now commits uh, transform scripts only run one time um, and then they, you can repeat them if you want but you have to sort of they, we just change the default but all this is to say we've been sort of like really we've been on a coll collision course with this exact conversation of like I want to be able to say for these 55 cells or for every cell that looks like this I want you to take that number and multiply it by five or for every cell that has these 15 conditions long I want to do this and that and this and that. And the idea that you should be able to sort of stack those things, edits that you want to make as a commit, as a set of non-destructive things, flip them around, play with them, see how it looks, and then hit commit, and that will actually make your data change. Of course, as you said, by if we write down the steps you took to do that, it makes the validity of the edits and the cleanup work that you've done higher. Um, if we combine that with uh, the capacity to see what is valid and isn't valid, um, that helps us on the sort of like, previewing side of things. Uh, so you should be able to define for yourself. If you if you can define, if you can define a simple heuristic, Richard, in your example, it sounds like you, there are no real sort of simple heuristics for messy data, um, which is a really interesting problem. Um, um, I don't know that they're none, but they're not easy. And some are easier than others. Like when I first download any, our district is from 59th Street to 110th Street. So any street that's 111, 112, and for more complex reasons, like I don't get um, data just from exactly our district, uh, especially if I'm pulling it by lat long. Uh, so I have to filter out all of the crashes that are out of district. That's relatively simple. Uh, I have to flip flop streets and avenues that also relatively simple, but not as simple. Uh, there's somewhere I need to add in uh, location if I just have lat long, which is a lot harder. Um, so there, it's a, a range of difficulty scale. That's a really interesting one. So if, if you if you had a, like, can I pitch you the perfect? What I think would be the perfect tool is you could have map. There's a box on that map that shows exactly your district, and it just says only give me data that are where lat long points are inside of this. Is that a starting point? Yeah, so I mentioned to Chris and Rico when we met that uh, I've been doing this for years and I noticed that recently the number of crashes in the district started dropping dramatically. And I was thinking, you know, hey, what we're doing is working. And then realized like, yeah, it's impossible. It's just too dramatic a drop. And the reason was I had been pulling the data from the online data set using uh, zip code, um, using uh, the four zip codes that make up our district. And I realized that um, as of a few years ago, a lot of crashes were not reported by address uh, as the police started just using um, whether their iPhones or whatever device they were using. Uh, they were reporting them just by clicking a button saying location. And oh, it was wow. only putting lat long in, it wasn't putting any other data. So it wasn't putting <laughs> either address or zip code. And so oh, there are a wow. lot of, or it might have put the street and cross street, but it didn't put the, uh, the zip code. So wow. what I had to do was figure out for our district, what's the highest possible and lowest possible lat and long search for that greater square. Of See, Drew a bounding box on the map and said inside this box, good. Yeah, but because Manhattan's not uh, straight north south, yeah. it means the bounding box is a uh, is a, a rectangle that doesn't fit. So you have to make it bigger, which means you get the the upper and lower and left and right corners that totally. don't fit within the district. So you have to totally. get rid of those. Yeah. Again, just total pain in the ass for all the stuff. Yeah, I could totally see how like you're getting bits of like, yeah, oh man, that's, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's a biggie. Oh my gosh, this is a great and, example. And part of this could be solved by the publisher. 
but especially with it being you know, the New York City and state governments, they're not out to uh, to publish the perfect data set. Right, right. And, it, and in this case, they're, they're uh, yeah, it's in so many ways, it's easier to adapt and grow the way that you look at that. Like it's, it may be a total pain for you to sort of like de-skew that map. Um, but like the, this knowledge that you have that, that a bunch of like you, you like your, your understanding of this data, like knowing that a bunch of that stuff just does not contain accurate addressing information, but it, the lat long values are more accurate or at least are more consistent. Um, is like domain specific knowledge that we feel like is sort of like trapped in your head. And we want, we want to be able to sort of get that out and make that possible. And the cleaning work that you're doing, your data is better than what the city has, right? Like you, you have put the time into yeah. yep. making it useful. And so for that reason, if someone else could take it and sort of like help complement that in some other way, if we could lighten the load of the work that you're doing, um, ideally that would save up more, free more time for you to do analysis. Um, and that's, that's the yeah. thing that we're hoping to get to. Or make it available for others to do analysis. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Ah, okay, this is great. Yeah, I think I, I think it's really interesting how much like we've we've really been exam we spent a bunch of time looking at I just wanted to sort of, like point to some shifts that have happened in the course of this call. Um, when we've been talking about editing, we've really been focused on like individual cells um, as like a good starting point. Um, mainly because a lot of the use cases that we th we're thinking about are these sort of like smaller ones um, where we're thinking like 85, 100 rows. And I think for those those places, um, which are very fairly common, we do and. As you said, like we, you're not the only person whose problems we're trying to solve, and so we do think that individual cell edits are just kind of like uh, a, a bare minimum uh, in any context. But uh, this notion of like, as as Rob brought up, we have this we have this concept already built into query called transforms, which are where you get to just write full code um, to, uh, and you can do whatever you want to edit it instead using full programmatic tools. Um, there's a couple of problems with it. The biggest is it's not, even if you do know how to code, it's not like easy, the easiest thing to crock. Um, and the other thing is if you don't know how to code, like if you're in the context where you you are doing very real and very uh, intense data cleaning and analysis, Richard, but you're not doing that in, in the context of Python. Um, so if we if we were like, yeah, it's easy, just learn how to code. Like that's not, that's not the tool coming to you. That's not things getting easier. Um, and so what we now need to think about a little bit is, is how does that UI work? And we are by no means the first people on the face of the planet to try and say, it's easy, we'll make a widget that just applies a bunch of code under the hood and it works really well. Um, the devil is truly in the details on this one and getting it right is, is, is pretty tough. Um, but I think it's really interesting to, to rethink, okay, if we could put these transform scripts on a trajectory so that one day you're just dragging and dropping UI, that would be really nice. Um, and then in the background, we're just working on first on a stepping stone that gets us some programmatic tools where maybe we write some code that cleans up this data for you and show it to you and say, hey, this is how this is how we do that, which will get you cleaner data faster. Um, but uh, we can then sort of like talk through how we might automate tools around that or, auto or automate UI around that. Um, could be really fun. With that, it's now three o'clock and I do not want to take, I've already taken a minute extra of time on top of this hour, but um, thank you everybody so much for engaging in this discussion. This is super exciting. Um, I'm really, really pumped up to sort of modify some of our thinking around this. Um, but yeah, uh, we do these calls every week. Thank you for joining. Uh, uh, next week is our building query call where we're gonna get nerdy. Sounds like we're gonna talk about a selection API for transforms. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining. And I think we'll kind of leave it at that, if that's okay. Thank you very much, especially Richard. I really appreciate you blocking uh, off the time, especially to, to join a call of people you don't uh, totally know. So we appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>